Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, Houseplanty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So are you the kind of person that currently has a bit of a struggling plant, or you're a big, big time plant parent like myself and you've got one or two struggling plants, or are you the person who can never get any plants to be happy because they start throwing hissy fits, they have brown leaves, yellow leaves, all of these things. This video is probably going to be for you. And let me start off by saying that there is nobody out there, myself included, that has not had a struggling plant, a dying plant, whatever you want to call it, in the past basically. I have lost count of how many plants I have kind of killed off basically. Accidentally, never intentionally, but yeah, the, you are not alone and never think that you are if your plant is struggling. Even if your plant that is struggling, you're seeing everybody else going, this is the easiest plant in the world. I have killed so many easy plants. I've probably killed more easy plants than I have difficult plants. <laughs> but what I wanted to do in this video is kind of give you my top kind of strategy in terms of troubleshooting, what the problem might be, and trying to figure out what you can do to solve the problem. And the reason why I'm doing this is I get over the however many years now that I've been on YouTube, on Instagram, with kind of more houseplanty continents, the questions and the kind of DMs that I get on a regular basis tend to be people asking me, my plant is struggling, these things, what is it? What do I need to do? So I thought I'd at least put everything in a video and hopefully this can act as a kind of information repository. I encourage all of you as well, if you've got your own tactic technique on how to troubleshoot and what to do if you find out certain things, to add them down below and hopefully this will become a kind of knowledge base of a video for everybody to just kind of go here and just go, you know what, I found all the information that I need here. I should be now kind of knowledgeable enough to at least attempt to self-diagnose what my plant issues might be. So a quick overview of what some of the most common issues tend to be with most house plants. And I think this would apply actually to most plants in general, but I'll speak specifically to house plants because these are the ones that we're looking at and more worried about in our own environment. So one of the things might be kind of watering. It could be light levels, it could be humidity or lack of humidity, it could also be pests or disease. These are all things that unfortunately for all of us can present themselves in very, very similar manners basically. So it's good to be able to at least dive into it and just kind of figure out, look, at least what direction am I heading in? Is it pests? Oh, if it is pests, then I need to kind of be considering these things. Is it diseases? If it's if it's diseases, is it one of these things that I need to go down there? Is it watering? What do I need to be kind of looking at for the watering side of things? So overall, those are going to be the big hitters in terms of why your plant might be struggling. Actually, I have just thought of another one. Transport. A lot of people, I'm just about to get an order from Equigenera, which is coming in from an entirely different part of the world, there is struggling plants and have troubleshoot them from there as well. So there could be kind of transport shock and all of these things. So let's dive into kind of the overarching way of how you can kind of start looking at some of these issues and dealing with them as well. And we can help troubleshoot a plant that I've got in front of me today, which is a very, very, very sad looking pothos enjoy. <laughs> Not all of it is, but you can see, and if I just go like that, a leaf comes off. If I go like this, another leaf comes off. If I go like this, another leaf comes off. Some people might already have an idea of what the plant issue might be, but this is something that has occurred since moving into this new conservatory space, and I have an inclination of what the issue might be. I think it's also compounded by a secondary issue. So let's dive into kind of one of the first things that you really should be doing in terms of troubleshooting any plant. And it's nice and simple, and it is. So for instance, I don't know if you can kind of see, there are some sections that are still okay. I'm gonna do this off camera, but I will show you in just a moment. 
any part that you see that's still healthy, make sure that you've got sanitized instruments, take a cutting. If you've got more healthy sections, take more cuttings. And I will do for this one and get a few cuttings, mainly because I know that I can just regrow this. This struggled like this kind of last year as well. So it kind of almost seems like the, the thing that this plant does is it goes for about a year, it then throws a hissy fit at the beginning of spring, and I need to start pretty much all over again. And you can see the plant is now considerably smaller. But the reason obviously that you want to be doing something like taking cuttings is this is your insurance. So whatever happens, whatever you might find, you've at least got some cuttings. There's going to be a couple of things that we're going to look at in just a moment and some of the other steps that you might need to check your cuttings for as well. But always a good idea to take some, if you can, if you've got the luxury, take a cutting. You might not be, obviously this is <laughs> premium, so there's quite a few leaves, but it might just be a node and a leaf. Take a cutting, basically. It's always a good idea to have insurance and to have backup as well, because not only do most of us at some point or another kind of have to deal with killing off a plant accidentally, but at least if you've got a, a kind of backup version of that, then if you've diagnosed it wrong and you've gone down the process of trying to figure out what it is, and maybe you've kind of gone, oh, actually it was probably, you're kind of between, is it this or is it this? And you went with option A, but it was eventually option B, you've got a backup. The next big thing, and this is again, more preventative rather than curative. So this is something that will help you diagnose a bit easier in the future. If you're a bit worried about a plant that you're getting and you're just like, oh, I don't know, and this could be a bit of a challenging plant, or maybe you've seen one of my review videos and just realized that it, uh, using something like a clear plastic pot. So I don't know if you can see, there's a root there. That means I can see the roots relatively easily. I can see the condensation levels and hopefully that's coming up. Yeah, it is. So I can see the condensation levels on here as well. That's a question that comes up a lot of the times when people are using something like semi-hydro. Is it time for me to water yet? If you're seeing condensation on the inside, it means there's still moisture in there. No, do not water at that point. But that is always a good thing to see. And you don't have to have fancy kind of, this is I think is an aroid pot from the guys at Soil Ninja. You don't even need to have this. I'll show you another example. Something as simple as a clear plastic cup. I've got holes that I've got in here for ventilation, but this is another easy way of being able to kind of keep some roots. I don't know whether or not you're going to be able to see them, but this is another easy way and it's cheap because most people will have this. Just make sure that you've added some form of drainage at the bottom of this before you do this. This is more ideal for smaller plants and cuttings and all of these things. So that is something to bear in mind. But yeah, having something like a clear pot, which unfortunately I do not have for the plant that I'm troubleshooting today, is an easy way of being able to just kind of go, okay, I can see that it's maybe a root rot issue because you can kind of see in, you can potentially see if there's any pests kind of going around there. Ironically enough, I'm in a conservatory, so sometimes I tend to get slugs. So <laughs> clear pots are very good because I can see the slugs in the roots. But yeah, so clear plastic pots are something you can do if you think that something might be troublesome in the future. Or if you're rehabbing a plant or you've got cuttings from it, so for instance, with this one, if I think, if I find that it's an issue that kind of is ongoing, then I might want to next time I pot this kind of epipremnum enjoy into a pot, use a clear plastic pot, because I won't have to do the next step that we're going to look at now. So the next step, and I'll try to use this as an example because I'm hoping I'm going to be able to get it out, is I've got a standard pot, I've got soil mix, I don't have a kind of aroid soil mix, and I want to check the roots. There is no two ways around doing this, and essentially what we're doing through all of this, clear plastic pots, and these as well, is you are checking the roots to see if there's any root rot issues. So I've got a begonia here, and I'm gonna try and take it out without it getting annoyed with me too, too much, and me dropping everything on the ground as per usual. But if I take it out, you might be able to see the roots there, there you go. Um, and you can see these are healthy roots and I don't want to disturb it too, too much. And that's 
the other big hint is a lot of people have always asked me, oh, do I need to unpot it and check the, um, the roots for all of these things? And a lot of the times what people do when they ask me that question is they take it out and they immediately repot it. So let me give you a tiny bit of advice there. If you're entirely unpotting it, taking out all of the soil and putting it into a new pot, and it isn't that that's the issue, you've then given the plant that's struggling potentially with something else another thing to struggle with. Because it's now got option A, which might be pests, for instance, but it's also now got all of its roots disturbed as well. So it's like a double whammy. So what I always say with things in pots, be very gentle and just do what I did. Try lifting it out and just looking at the roots around it. Don't go digging just yet. However, that being said, if I had lifted this up and I was seeing a lot of root rot in the actual soil mix that I was getting here, and you can see it instantly from the roots on the outside, at that point, I'd probably say, yes, you need to start digging in and checking the roots in a bit more detail because you've probably got some root rot at that point. Now, the other thing to bear in mind with this is that and I will say this before anybody else does, sometimes the roots on the outside, like I've just lifted it up before, you can see that it was healthy, but the roots on the inside might be rotting. That is something that you might need to, if you've followed a lot of the other steps that we're gonna talk about and none of it are the issues, you might need to come back to this and then maybe start digging into the roots to see if maybe the internal roots on the very inside of the soil, not the ones on the outside, have started to rot out. So. That's the little caveat that you just need to remember there, basically. And just really briefly before we move on, just for the people before anybody says, oh, why would you use clear pots with a soil mix? This is an alocasia jacqueline, and I'm hoping it might focus. Can you see the roots there? You can still see the roots in clear pots, even if you're using something like an aroid mix. So ignore the, the white sections. That is not variegation. That is paint. <laughs> But yeah, let's move on to unpotting my specific one. I might mute this section because anybody who's trying to take pon out of another pot knows that it can get a bit loud and clangy. Okay, so this is really interesting because I don't know whether or not that's gonna come up. You might be able to see there's a root there that looks quite healthy. Are there some rotted roots in here? Yes, I think there are. But interestingly enough, if I just shake, 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 shake. Yes, so there is some root rot. You might be able to see some of the darkness in there as well, but there are some healthy roots in here. And some of the root rot I would expect to be there, but we're still getting a plant that is struggling and you can see it on the leaves there. So that's the big thing that you want to be doing with all of these things that I was talking about, the clear pots, the kind of lifting it out of the thing is looking for something like root rot, those dark roots that are kind of mushy. That's how you would kind of see what root rot is. And I have done another video all about root rot specifically, and I'll link it at the top there. And then you need to deal with it in that format, which would be kind of making sure that you're taking the roots out, you're letting them air dry because what is kind of attaching onto those roots and causing that rot. And I'm always kind of a bit, is it fungus, is it bacteria? I think it might be bacteria, but it's anaerobic. And it just generally means that it doesn't, it thrives in an environment where there is little kind of air and oxygen essentially. And you would imagine if something is sitting in water for a long period of time, which is what you would get if you get root rot in something like soil, or even the semi-hydro mixes, it means that it will kind of start thriving in that environment because it likes it. It's got, it's got no air. So putting something out to dry will generally kill off what is causing the root rot. You still need to cut off the root rot and a root rot. Words are hard on a Sunday morning. And then you would need to cut further back on the root. But as I said, there is that other video that I've linked hopefully at the top somewhere. Go and check that out in a, for a much more in-depth view. The other thing that you want to be doing, and hopefully you might be able to see this, maybe blowing me out today a bit on this video, is check, check, check your light levels. I think that might be what's wrong with this plant. 
and I will show you on these two specific leaves, hopefully you might be able to see. Can you see that the white sections are still relatively white from the variegation, but it's the green sections that went black? And that's the thing that you need to be looking at for light levels. And the example that I'm bringing in here, and that just kind of confirmed my line of thought, at least partially, is I bought my Epipremnums and my Pothos, and I've done a video on the new conservatory and moving everything back in, and I have an Epipremnum corner. It's looking like the death corner at the moment, because there was an awful lot of light coming into this conservatory, and I'm pretty sure it scorched all of the leaves. Because normally if it was something more along the lines of root rot, the first thing, and this was been my experience, correct me if you think that you've had different experiences, the first thing that tends to rot off on a leaf tends to be the variegated section, not the green section. The green section will eventually rot out as well, but the plant will sacrifice its variegated section which doesn't have any chlorophyll in it, a lot faster than it will the green section, which is still providing it with energy, essentially. So something to bear in mind. So that's the other thing. And when I was talking about compounding issues, when I bought the plants in here and they started causing that issue, I originally had thought it might be one other thing as well. And this is touching on the other point that you need to be looking at, is your watering. The watering, so the overwatering can lead to root rot, Underwatering can also lead to root rot because what you might get is if you've underwatered a plant for a longer period of time, the roots kind of dry out and kind of desiccate. And by the time you've rehydrated it, there's not those roots to pick everything up. You've watered it the same way that you would normally water it, not knowing that your roots have dried off into kind of papery nothingness. And it creates that perfect environment for rot to kind of settle back in. So you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you do. Do you see what I mean in the beginning of the video? Sometimes some of the ways that these things come across are quite, quite similar. And you might see a lot of videos that go on a very generalized topic and say, underwatering can cause yellowing in leaves. Overwatering can cause yellowing in leaves as well. But the context that most people give there, don't give there is, what are you doing? So for instance, and this is the thing, you are the other parameter that you need to kind of bear in mind there is, if your water is sitting in boggy water the whole time and the plant is never drying out and you're getting yellowing leaves, it's probably overwatering that's causing root rot. If your plant hasn't been watered for two and a half months and all of a sudden you're getting yellowing leaves, guess what the problem might be basically? It's, I know it sounds silly and it seems really straightforward, but sometimes we all get so paranoid with things that we forget this. So just bear that in mind as well. So definitely coming back to that kind of light level damage, I thought it might be the light level was getting too much light, or it could be the fact that when I was moving things around from the conservatory before it was torn down into the house and then from the house back into the conservatory, at the stage where it was in the house, because it was getting lower light levels, I watered less. And when it came back in here, I'm just like, oh, it might be struggling from that. So let me overwater. <laughs> Give it a reservoir when it didn't have it before. So <laughs> don't do a me. Don't change too many things. As I said, if it was originally partially stressed with one thing, try and see if you can troubleshoot it before you try to address another thing. But yeah, light levels, there is a good resource, and I'm trying to remember who it was that did the kind of light levels. Obviously, you can go for the fancier equipment and buy like a, a light meter. You can do it sometimes on phones. They're not perfect, but at least it gives you a bit of a guide, and I'll show you kind of some screenshots here, and you can kind of see the different light levels. Just check what the light level is where you've got the plant. Has anything changed? Did you have a curtain there and the, the curtains are no longer there? Are we moving into the summer months where there's a lot more light coming in and you've put it there in the winter because it was getting more light there, but in the summer it might be getting bleached out? Did a building go up in front of your window that you never had before and it's blocking all the light, so it means the plant is getting less light? All of these things will come into play. So be aware of your light levels. And if you think that it's light levels, what's changed or what's happened. But it, the way that you will know this is by having some vague idea beforehand of what the light levels were before and what they are now, basically. Humidity is another one that a lot of people like to go on about. Now, humidity is an interesting one, and I've always been a proponent with humidity, and this one does take a bit of finessing, that even the 
plants that need a lot of humidity, as long as you've got the watering perfect, they will do okay. They won't look their best, they might still get crispy tips at the end of their leaves, and I'm thinking of the very, very fine leaves of something like a fern, for instance. But if you've got their care just right, as I mentioned, and I think I've shown a plant in another review, and I think I'll put it at the top there, which was the Made in Her Fern review, that can be in household humidity without crisping up as long as it's something like self-watering and it's getting just the right amount of moisture that it needs because it's absorbing as and when it needs it. Now, humidity in a household conditions might bring by a couple of things. And it might be things like your, and I'm looking at my elbow now when I took it out for a week out of the high humidity, the white sections of the leaves started crisping up entirely. There's also something of note to bear in mind there that a lot of the times crisping on white sections of the leaves, I was talking about the crisping on the black, um, the blackening of the green parts of the leaves as I was showing you just a moment ago, the crisping on variegated sections tends to be closely related to lower humidity levels. I have seen people in kind of almost 100% humidity terrariums where they've kept plants with entirely white leaves, granted none of that is photosynthesizing, but they've kept it pristine without any browning for over a year. And that's just because the conditions were just perfect and it wasn't causing too much of an issue. At least that's what I think it is. I'm not a scientist, as I've mentioned before, when it comes to plants specifically. So I might be wrong, but I have noticed that when you move highly variegated plants, with massive white sections out of high humidity environments, you will start getting that crisping. And that's a fact of life, basically. It's something that most people did not realize, myself included, when you're buying big variegated plants, like something like a Monstera albo, that you're gonna need to have decent humidity levels to keep those white sections looking white and not crispy and brown. And I think a lot of us have realized this since all getting it, and it's just like, I can't keep the white sections white, they're all browning off. You probably need slightly higher humidity levels. There's other plants as well that it could be the polar opposite. You've got succulents, you've got cacti and all these things, and you've kept the humidity way too high. Like if I bought cactus or succulents in here, they would love the light that's frying <laughs> the poppers at the moment, but they would hate the humidity because they would their soil media would never dry out. And you need to think about where these plants are coming from as well. So I always, always encourage you to do your research online and see where some of these plants are coming from. A really good example is I've got a couple of orchids in here that are not the standard Phalaenopsis. I've got the Dracula solii, which is the monkey mask orchid. And somebody kind of reached out when I was talking about the fact that I've not been able to get it to bloom since I've had it for two years now. And they were just like, yeah, they're in, uh, I think they're called cloud forests. The humidity is super high all the time. And the other thing that you need to remember there is temperature. And this is kind of related a bit to the humidity in the sense of what's the temperature doing, basically. And just to expand a bit more on the temperature there, for instance, and I've mentioned this before in previous videos, some plants, and I'm kind of stroking the Ismeral dense because that is a good example. Some plants are highly sensitive to the temperatures dropping even below 15 degrees Celsius. So you need to bear that in mind. These are tropical plants. They're not used to getting very, very low humidity levels. Usually online, you should be able to see the range of temperatures that a plant could deal with. Now, last year during the heat wave, for a prolonged period of time, this conservatory was over... 43, 45 degrees Celsius constantly. And it also was 20 to 30% humidity. It was exceptionally dry. Did these plants struggle? Yes. Did any of them die off or show any real signs of kind of distress? No, but I kept the watering high. The point I'm trying to make is, at least in my experience, the, the temperature that you need to be worried about and checking is the lower temperatures. So kind of the winter months, really, what's happening there. The summer months, high, high heat levels. As I said, most of these plants should do okay as long as you're keeping on top of your watering. The other thing you need to be doing in terms of troubleshooting your plant is checking for pests. And I actually found this on a leaf before, before I showed you 
the allocation. Jacqueline, let me see if I can bring it in so we can focus. Can you see the two mealy bugs? One in there and one at the top there. So checking for pests. And you should ideally be doing this not when the plant has shown signs of struggle, but we've all been there and done that. That's fine as well, it's as long as you treat it. But you need to kind of be doing it maybe every time you're watering. Just lift a couple of leaves up and see. And I have done a whole video on pests and I will put it on there rather than me going into details as to what you need to be looking at. But pests are another thing that could potentially bring yellowing leaves. It could give marks on the leaves that you're not kind of sure of what they might be. The one that I actually found quite interesting and it took me a while to figure out was thrip damage on a Monstera adansonia, which came across as little black dots. And I'm just like, it doesn't look like anything else. And it's definitely not thrips because thrips look like this, but on that specific plant, it looked like that. Sometimes with situations like that, you might not always know, but have a look, check online, I, review series like mine, or even kind of websites might come have this. Have a look at what other people's common pests are for certain plants and look at those first, basically. It's not always the case, like, just because somebody's epipremnum might never have had mealybugs doesn't mean that yours might not get mealybugs. But it gives you a good starting place on how to start off and then you can kind of adjust and go, oh, okay, so this is what I'm looking at. And if I can find a reference with some images so you can kind of see what different pest damage looks like on leaves, I will link it down in the description below. The other thing on a similar note is something like fungus, bacteria, viruses, all of these things will have an effect and you should be able to start seeing them on your leaves first. And when I say fungus, a lot of people are just like, mushrooms, I've occasionally got a mushroom growing in my pot. Again, I'll see if I can find some kind of reference material and put them in the description down below, but not all mushrooms that might be growing in kind of soil mixes in some of the plants, especially plants that you might have never repotted from like garden centers and stuff like that are necessarily bad for you or the plant. They're probably not edible, so you might want to avoid pets getting them and munching on them, but it's not all of them have got issues. But you might get powdery mildew as well on leaves and things like that. And then you need to be looking at going, is the humidity really high all the time in my kind of environment where this plant is sitting? Is there no air circulation? Yeah, you probably get some mildew on your plants. So things like that, and a lot of people tend to go to bacteria, viruses, and fungus first. And I might be going out on a limb here, and again, I can only judge this on my experience. Those are the outside kind of parameters, as in like those are usually not common issues for a lot of people's plants. For a lot of people's plants, it's gonna be something like, root rot or the watering or the light levels or the temperature or pests. The last thing, if you've managed to kind of eliminate everything else on the list that we were just talking about, then start looking at bacteria, fungus and viruses. Again, based on my experience with that one, don't go to the critical thing. It's, a, it's kind of the example that I will find some here at Times here is um, and I studied for my first degree, which was human anatomy. I studied alongside a lot of doctors and medics and nurses that were training. And uh, they are horrendous at that stage in their kind of learning career of being kind of paranoid about everything because they study everything. And a lot of the times the, the teachers that taught them were just like, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. If you've got symptoms that feel like you've got a common cold, you've probably got a common cold rather than this really rare, rare, rare condition up here that has some of the similar traits. It's a similar thing with viruses and bacteria. It's that kind of, mm, is it really this? Because I've managed to eliminate everything else that's kind of more common. That's the stage you kind of look at that. And I think a lot of people, again, based on DMs that I'm getting, tend to go there for <laughs> to start with the, the more simpler solutions. A lot of the times it might just be moving it to a different light position, getting it closer or further away from the heat, checking for rot, things like that. And we're coming on to the point now of what's the next steps to this. So the first thing I would say, again, depending on how big your collection is or how forgetful you might be, I've done this and it really has helped me, take pictures, especially when you've figured out what it is. So 
Do you remember what I was talking about a moment ago with the Monstera adansonia and it was those black speckly dots at the back of the leaves that were thrips that didn't kind of translate in the same way? I took images of that, saved them on my phone somewhere in a little folder and named it and kind of said thrip damage on adansonia. So the next time it might come up in a year's time, two years time, three years time, and you're just like, what was that? I remember I dealt with it. What was it? You've then got a resource that you've created yourself that should remind you of what it is. So it's always a good idea to kind of document as you go along. It's more kind of a scientific approach there, really. And obviously, the penultimate thing is take action. What was the issue? Was it root rot? Deal with the root rot and repot and kind of baby the plant back to health. Was it pest? Have you dealt with the pest in the way that those pests would respond to? So for instance, mealybugs, if you spray it down with um, rubbing alcohol or any of the other kind of ways that you could do it with neem oil and things like that. Have you used beneficial kind of predatory insects? All of these things. Have you done the next step, basically? And this video isn't going to talk about the next steps on this, but it's it's the kind of common things. If it's root rot, deal with the root rot, repot. If it's pests, deal with the pests and check back on the pests for the next four or five weeks, every couple of weeks checking and possibly respraying down. If it's light, have you moved it? If it's humidity, have you changed the humidity? If it's a virus, fungus or bacteria, have you seen how you could potentially deal with that? Take the action at that point. Obviously, remember the very first point that we were talking about there, you've had hopefully taken cuttings, regardless of what it was. So pat yourself on the back, take a deep breath. Don't worry about it too, too much because at least you've got a backup. And that's why I started with the backup first because if you didn't take the backup and you were doing all of these things and trying to rehab a plant and ultimately it still died, you're left with nothing. If you've taken a backup cutting and started rooting it out, especially from a healthier section, you can be a bit more reassured that obviously you'd still want that plant to recover, but even if it all goes wrong, you've got a backup and you're not starting from zero. And ultimately, hopefully without sounding patronizing towards the end, learn from the experience. Learn and adapt and change and learn that, for instance, if this is what I did and it caused this issue to my Monstera, don't do it again with Monsteras. It might not apply to all of the plants, but at least you know that that specific plant had that issue. You've dealt with it. Try to adjust so that it doesn't happen again the next time. It's kind of one of those things that if you keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result, you probably won't get a different result. So learn and change and adapt. So I'll give you an example. For instance, this is an Aglionema, I think. Yeah, an Aglionema and, ooh, pests. I need to deal with pests with this one. See what I mean? Every time I pick up a plant, I look at it and go, what's hiding in the nooks and crannies? And then I can deal with that on the spot, basically. Ooh, oh, the mealybugs on this are real. They're going to be dealt with. But for instance, this, the reason why I picked it up is not because it had pests. This had root rot. I did everything that I wanted to do before I learned. I mean, this one might need a, a bit of a, a clean of its pot at some point. I put it in a clear pot so I can see the roots. In the future, I dried it out. I kind of like rehabbed it. I did take a cutting and I had managed to root that cutting. I didn't need the second one of these. So I gifted that to a friend, but I was able to rehab it and learn from my experience. So for instance, it was caused by root rot when it was in a soil mix. I changed it's growing media, so it's now in a semi-hydro mix and it's in a clear pot so I can see its roots adapt, basically. So, and it will help you grow your confidence in your collection and your confidence to be able to troubleshoot your own plants. The other thing of note here that not a lot of people touch on is the ability to troubleshoot plants that you might have never heard of before and you've just purchased and there's very little written about it online. I'll, an example of this was the spiral ginger. When I first got it, the variegated spiral ginger, there wasn't an awful lot of information online. I did do a resource video for people if they want to see it, I'll put it at the top there. But yeah, there are moments like that when you build your confidence and you can start doing your own troubleshooting for some of these common issues, that generally that aligned with what you've learned in terms of caring for different kind of species in general would mean that you can be given a plant, 
that you've got very little information about how to care for properly and be able to take some educated guesses as to where to start. And that is very, very powerful. You then become the resource that you'd be looking at somewhere else. You yourself are the resource for your own collection. It sounds more deep than I wanted it to be, but you know what I mean. You, you will have the knowledge to be able to kind of make those critical decisions for yourself. As I mentioned throughout the video, I will find different resources and add them down in the description below if you want on some of the light levels, potentially what the bacteria, viruses, funguses like that will look like in terms of imagery. I'll add as many of those links down in the description below, so do check that out. And as with most of these videos, if you found it helpful, if you think somebody that you know, love, friends, family, all these things might find it useful because they're constantly struggling with their plants and you want to share it with them, please do. It does really, really help the channel. One of my big goals for this year is I want to kind of grow the channel even further in terms of viewers and subscribers because the more of you I've got along for the ride, the more of these videos I can create. So yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon and I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.